Hi, everyone. I'm Pressure Fed Astronaut. This is End of Pressure Fed Astronaut, the podcast where we talk about me ending, or space probes, or something like that. Who are you? Um, uh, I am End of Mission, uh, here at Face of Sarcasm to end you, and um, I guess everything that we're trying to do, I, I don't know. Well, today we're to talk about how the audio still sucks, or something like that. Actually, it should be better now. I hope I fix it. Hopefully. Well, I'm going to get a new mic, but... Yeah. Okay. Well, we're recording it again, so what are we talking about today? <laughs> Why don't you tell me again? <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about Haiten Hegeromo, the first Japanese mission to the moon. Oh, sweet. And there, there it is. There's Haiten with a camera to spy on you. And there's uh-huh. Hagoromo, this little guy. Goes right on top there. Oh, look at the cute little guy. Oh, he wears it like a hat. Oh, that's yeah. nice. And of course, you can see in the next image here, look. Bunch of loop-de-loops. Let's do some loop-de-loops. And some TCMs, some Turner Classic Movies. Nice. Yep. Also, I took a vacation. Wow, the this is, uh, the historical documentary is going to look sick once it gets on to uh, the History Channel. It is. Because actually, the Japanese did stay here in Fort Santiago during World War II. Oh, cool. Yeah, so I took a vacation to the Philippines. This picture was taken of me as I was dying of heat stroke. Nice. Yeah, it was really hot over there. <laughs> uh, Imagine, you're in the tropics. Yeah. Okay, so here's the background on this mission. Japan, shock of all shocks, has a space program. Did you know this? Really? I think I've heard of it. It's called JAXA, right? After 2003. After two, so before 2003, what was There's it? There's two, two separate space agencies and then a national uh, a launch vehicle program. So you got NASDA, which is the National Space Development Agency. Then you had the mm-hmm. National Aerospace Laboratory now and then the institute of space and aeronautical science isis oh i i pronounced it with an a in the second part there just so you know no one confuses it with something else yeah just so the for all the fbi agents who are big fans of the channel that that's isas yeah it's also on the slide as you can see yeah it's written there yeah so japan uh, japan's actually the only access power from world war ii to develop their own indigenous launch capacity fun fact Really? Oh, Germany almost did. Almost. Well, yeah, then we uh, then we robbed them, right? <laughs> no, I'm referring to Otrag, but okay. Oh, You're going okay. there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we uh, yoinked them, Yeah. Right? Yes, we did. But they also had Otrag, which had been West German. and Well, actually, now they have some private companies. There's ISAR and uh, RFA. ISAR, fun fact, one of the founders is the nephew of Lutz Kaiser from Otrag. Uh. Oh, nice. We should be talking... So it's like a heritage thing. <laughs> yeah. No third world dictators this time, though, I don't think. Probably for the best. Bummer, right? Yeah. Okay. So, by 1990, Japan had a respectable space program growing. Their biggest achievement at the time, aside from their own indigenous launch capacity, which is actually based off our rockets... Uh, well, what isn't? <laughs> yeah. Well... I, well they did develop their own internal launch vehicles, the Mew family. We'll see that later. But their okay. liquid rockets were based off uh, Thor Delta and then Delta. Ah. And they just based their orbital launchers based off of that. So nice. by 1990, they had their own respectable space program. Their biggest achievement at the time were their two Halley's Comet probes. Uh, mm. Suise and Asakigake. I pronounced those wrong. I don't speak Japanese. So I probably did it wrong. All of the weebs uh, from our lovely audience are now going to kill you with katanas. Yeah. It's it's just to protect your honor, you know? Yeah, that's that's what we got to do. It's for you, really. Yeah, it's helping me. So these are the yeah. two spacecraft that went to Halley's Comet. Okay, so they're, they decided to play tennis with it? Those are antennas. So okay. you can see there's the dish, right? That's the dish, and there's the receiver, like satellite oh, okay. TV. Ah, I see. Yeah. Now, part of this, their growing admissions, involved partnering with NASA on a mission called 
Geotail, which is going to look at Earth's magnetic tail. Oh, so like Geo being Earth and then Tail being the tail. Yeah, which is going to measure Earth's magnetic field. But okay. the big clincher for Geotail, and that's this spacecraft here, is that it have to do a double lunar flyby to get to the right orbit. Oh, so it just, like, whips around the moon twice? Yeah. Nice. That's never actually been done before, though. Ooh, breaking new ground. Here we go. So, and Japan has more ambitious space program plans. I, they actually did uh, asteroid sample returns, right, to the Hayabusa missions to Io, Itokawa. Oh, cool. Actually, Itokawa was named for the father of their space program, Hideo Itokawa. Ah. That guy's really interesting. If you read up on him, he's really interesting. Nice. So Japan's going to start doing more complicated space missions, so they need to do some engineering tests and a technology demonstrator for their double lunar flyby. To basically say that, hey, we can do it? Yeah, to prove it. Okay. And that is Mu Space Engineering Spacecraft A, Muses A, or as it would be known once it flew, Haiten Hegarovo. So wait, they changed it after it flew? Yes. Because if it blew up, why give it a name? Uh, uh, okay. We do this with our uh, NOAA satellites, right? Famously, NOAA N was the one that fell over in the, oh. in the assembly area. So the, the one that was launched was NOAA N prime, and then it got a number once it reached orbit. Okay. Also, with like Tedris, uh, Goes, Pose, those guys. Uh, so Haiten in the Buddhist mythology is the celestial maiden. Okay. And Hagaromo is the feather mantle of Haiten. The feather mantle? A fancy hat. What does that mean? Hat? Yeah. Oh, it's a hat. That's what a mantle is, I think. Oh. It's a fancy hat. I thought it was the thing above the fireplace. That too. Well, it's the hat of the fireplace. It's the hat of the... Oh, okay. Think of it that way. All right. Yeah. So the spacecraft would weigh... A very fat 197 kilograms, so about 434.3 pounds. It would That's me on a bad day. Yeah. yeah. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hydrazine for propellant, it'd have about 42 kilograms, or about 92.6 pounds. That's me on a good day. Mm. Really good day. Mm. And then Hagaromo itself would weigh 12 kilograms, or about 26.5 pounds. Yeah, that's how it started. Yep. It's going to be about four and a half feet in diameter. It's good. It's a really small spacecraft. Yeah, not that big. And about 2.625 feet tall, about 0.8 meters. So it's like the size of a, of a washing machine. Yeah, it's a washing machine. That they're yeeting to the moon. Yeah. And you can see here in this diagram, we got, so there's Hagaromo on top. There's a thermal blanket. You know, keep it nice. We got two, nice and toasty. Yeah, two low gain antella and uh, antella. Oh, I can't antellas. Yeah, I don't know what an antella is. It sounds like the Antilles, like the islands, uh. or wedge Antilles, a character in Star Wars that I don't know about because I'm normal. I didn't know that that existed, but thank you for informing me. Yep, and you got some RCS thrusters for maneuvering. Mm -hmm. So the mission has six primary goals. Okay. Trajectory control for a double lunar swing by. Can you make a spacecraft to do this and meet the mission right. requirements? Okay. Pretty obvious, if you ask me. Yeah, the thing that it's trying to do. <laughs> Insertion of the sub-satellite, that's Hagaromo, into lunar orbit. So chuck it into lunar orbit. Yep. Put it around the moon. And then use uh, uh, Haiten as a relay to simulate other missions. Okay. Like if you land, like if you land something on Mars, right? Mm -hmm. you got to you got an orbiter to talk to it. That kind of thing. Okay, so it's like basically it's the cell surface. Yeah. Optical navigation techniques. So it's got a big camera up front to do some optical navigation. Test that so out. So just eyeballing it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tests of a fault tolerant computer. It's pretty much can you build a flight computer that like, get like radiation particles coming into digital computers that might cause errors? What? Yeah. So that's the big problem with like the Van Allen belts and flying through them. Oh, yeah, because they're massive radiation pools. Yeah, and it's high-energy particles that fly into digital electronics, which, right, semiconductors are just little switches. Right, so if the, so those little uh, those little particles come in and start s switching the switches without yeah. the computer telling it yeah. to. That's why the Apollo missions could go through different parts of the belts than uh, without as much shielding as, like, Orion has to, because those are all, you know, like, memory cord and, you know, 
tape oh, yeah, drives. They them. <laughs> they, yeah, it was etched in on stone. Yeah, that ancient caveman technology. <laughs> then it would do arrow breaking tests. You know, like with the earth? Yeah, you know what arrow breaking is, right? Yeah, smacking into the air to slow down. Yeah, it's because right, it's like a sail. Yeah. Yeah. But like the wrong way. Yeah. Or the right way if you're trying to do orbital insertion. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. if you can arrow break, you don't need as much propellant because you're using the air to cheat. All right, so it's like a parachute. Yeah. And then okay. six, detection and measurement of micrometeorite dust in the Earth-Moon system. Ah, the most interesting part of this entire Yes, it mission. is. Because there might be dust up there. How ah. much is there? Because you got to design missions around that, right? Because your space Right, rest- you got to design your vacuum cleaner uh, to yeah. accordance, right? Got to get that Dyson up there. Yep. And this will be the first dedicated mission to the moon since Luna 24, which is a sample return mission, in 1976. So, so wait a minute. There are like 15 years between moon missions? Yes. Now, technically, uh, ISEE-3 did lunar flybys in the 80s, huh? but that wasn't dedicated moon mission. They're just doing flybys. Right. But there were no moon missions. That, no dedicated. That's kind of yeah. scary. Yeah. Wait till you read about like, huh. Mars missions or Venus missions. It's just it's none for a long time. So there is Jeez. one experiment on board, of course, that is number six. That is the Munich dust counter. So it's German. They like counting things. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. We will go up there and count the dust, yeah. Yeah. Our uh, Raumschiff Staubsauger. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hope I said that right. It Stop. would be very bad if you did not. <laughs> Stopzager. Dust sucker. Yeah. The funniest German words. <laughs> fun, 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 sick, you know, 55. Yeah. Now, luckily, there were no Italians involved, so this would be a big access operation again. <laughs> oh, crap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We got that out of our system. <laughs> we're getting the band back together. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go see Oppenheimer next Friday, by the way. You also gonna go see, go see the Barbie movie? No. Oh, I don't care. Could be a Barbenheimer. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So yeah. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna detect and measure the velocity and mass properties of dust that uh, in the Earth Moon system that hit the spacecraft. So they're just going to count the dust and that was and how fast it's going towards the Moon system. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now this is the launch. This is a. Why is it sideways? Okay, so so you may remember that Japan was part of this band called the Axis. Oh yeah. And their big yeah. tour their first album called World War Two. Yeah, yeah. It, I remember that. It, it was big. It kinda of failed. Dedicated fan base, but it failed. Right. And some of the stipulations for losing World War Two was they couldn't build guided missiles. For good reason. Yeah. Because where yeah, would you point imagine. them? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, at the rock and roll center of the world. <laughs> yeah. Where's that? I don't know. Neither do I. So they had so the rockets, so their missiles, their rockets, not missiles, distinctly not missiles, used. <laughs> they pretty much pointed them. And oh yeah, <laughs> they pointed them to where they were so, going to be. <laughs> so they did caveman trajectories. Oh yeah, they got the little abacus out and everything. <laughs> Pretty much no guidance system. They knew the properties, and they just pointed it and hoped it'd get there. <laughs> it's like, how, which direction are we going to launch this? Ah, uh, that way. Yeah, yeah you know. <laughs> Should be a little bit to the left, a little bit more, a little bit perfect. Yeah. <laughs> this is the fifth country to reach orbit on their own. Or sixth. And they're using uh, tab, you know, like stone tablets to etch yeah. in the, the trajectory. Yeah. Well, what else are you going to do? They get guidance systems later on, don't worry. We, we let them have those. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah. So this is a Mu-3S-2. And that's, okay. this is the rocket here. It's, again, it's a very small rocket, because here's the spacecraft, right? It's like six yeah, feet across. It's, yeah, it's small. It's four and a half. Whatever. From what you said, right? Yeah, whatever. Whatever. So it launches at 8.46 p.m. Japan Standard Time on January 24th, 1990, on a Mu-3S2 from Kagoshima, Japan. That's their launch site. Okay. The launch vehicle places the spacecraft in the incorrect orbit, underperforming by 50 meters per second. So it's about... So they missed? Yes. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I wonder how. how. (laughs) Yeah, so it underperforms, right? The little kick motor. 
which translates to about 180,000 kilometers lower than intended. <laughs> Jesus. That's quite the... They missed quite a bit. Yeah. So they were aiming for 470,000 kilometers, you know, to hit the moon eventually. Yeah. So they had to use some contingency plans to get into the correct orbit because, you got to remember, they only have about, I think it's 300 meters a second of delta V. On the- so this would be like a sixth of of it to get at the correct orbit initially but it's in the wrong spot oh so that's just gonna so you cor- burn right. so they gotta correct it because it's in the because it's aiming for the wrong spot which means when it gets up to apogee it's gonna be the wrong spot when it comes back to the next one the moon's gonna be in the wrong spot oh, okay. and the next diagram will show this so it really just messed everything yeah. up they used 200 meters a second delta v to correct this and you can see that in wow. this uh, in these diagrams so so the one on the left here and the sun is over here i'm gonna draw it Okay. This is the sun. That's the sun. Very happy. Yep. The sun's always happy. I wonder why the sun's always happy. I don't know. So the initial trajectory, as you can see, uh, tosses the spacecraft. I think it's, yeah, this is the initial orbit, right? So this is one, two, four, and then it's going to fly by the moon and then fly by the moon. Okay. Right? Right. You see it kind of kink where the the moon's orbit yeah, so that's where the moon's gonna yeah it's gonna fly by the moon there okay. this is what actually happened so you can see the underperformance here so they adjust yeah. the trajectory to get it up so then it fly by the moon in the fifth orbit for its first lunar encounter okay yeah which on march 19th 1990 it does its first lunar flyby so it's a hey. two months later that's two months later two. yeah two full months two months yeah yeah almost two months yeah so the closest approach is 16 and a half thousand kilometers which is about 10 and a quarter thousand miles at this point Hagoromo separates and ignites its very tiny four kilogram solid rocket motor the target orbit mm-hmm. they're aiming for is 20,000 by 7,400 kilometers which is about 12 and a half thousand by four and a half thousand mile orbit and and the earth is 8,000 miles wide right Yes, the flat Earth is about 8,000 miles wide. So right. these are images taken from the uh, Japanese Space Agency uh, at the time for lunar insertion. So you can see so it's about there. You can see the motor ignite. There it is. Mm-hmm. It ignites, uh, and it burns out because it's a 4-kilogram motor. Okay. Big problem. So, so we're, just, we're just seeing like the engine flare yeah. in these images. That's what you're seeing. That's the exhaust okay. plume. Except there's a problem with Hagoromo. Uh-oh, the what happened? The S-band transmitter, the antenna, failed after ignition. So the so they don't have any communication with it? Yes. So they don't know if it actually entered orbit or not. Oh, no. And it's tiny. Remember, it's like the size of a beach ball. Right. So Hyten continues on its mission, right? It's doing the lunar flyby. So we mm-hmm. don't know if Hagoromo actually entered orbit around the moon or not. Because... So it's... So it's, it's lost in space. Yes, it's lost in space. Fun. Now, one theory is that it did enter lunar orbit, and it's still in orbit to this day, because it's a big enough orbit for the, the perturbations from mass cons on the moon wouldn't take it down. That's only for low lunar orbit, which this obviously wouldn't have been in. Yeah. <laughs> or the engine failed, and it's now in heliocentric orbit. Oh. Right? Got tossed around the moon, and it's just gone. Just yeeted out of the Earth-Moon system. Yep. Because that's lunar flybys, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it continues its mission. So it does seven more lunar swingbys, right? Flies by the moon seven more times. So after the first one, it does two tra- trajectory correction maneuvers to do another lunar flyby on July 11th, 1990. It okay. passes within 76,000 kilometers of the surface. Okay. That's pretty far away. Yeah. It's about 47,000 miles. And yeah. it completes the double lunar flyby maneuver meant for Geotail. Hey, hey, it works. mission successful. Yep. Then Hyten does another six swingbys just to show off. And it mm-hmm. sets itself up for the next demonstration. Arrow braking. Oh, sweet. Yeah. 
Aero braking, as we talked about, is using the atmosphere of a planet, or moon, I guess, because Titan's got an atmosphere, to slow you down your spacecraft. Yeah. That makes sense, right? Yeah. Smack into the air, slow down. Yep. So after Apogee 18, so that's, you can see it here. Oh, can I draw the sun? Give me a second. Oh, yeah. This is art, guys. Okay. There's the sun. It lowers the perigee to 125.5 kilometers, or 78 miles over the West Pacific. To put this into, okay, so that's pretty low. To put this into perspective, the Harp gun hit 108 kilometers. Oh. New Shepard goes to about 100. Okay, so it's still pretty high. It's high, but it's in the atmosphere. Okay. So on March 19, 1991... So a year later, Heitzen performs the first aero braking maneuver, and it hits the atmosphere at 11 kilometers per second. Well, that's fast. 6.84 miles per second. That's hauling. Yeah. This lowers the spacecraft's velocity by 1.712 meters per second, or about 5.62 feet per second. <laughs> so barely anything. <laughs> but it drops the apogee by 8,600 kilometers, <laughs> or about 5,400 miles. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. And oh, I'd, I noticed I noted this the first time we recorded it, because obviously we fixing our sound. If yep. Hyten had fired its engines at Perigee and got a delta V of about 80 meters per second, it'd be tossed out of the Earth-Moon system. Oh. It's really close to escape velocity from Earth. Dang. Yeah, because 11 kilometers per yeah. second. Isn't escape velocity like 11.2? Yeah. It's really close to being tossed out of the system. Dang. Yeah, which is a great way of simulating going to Mars, right? You're going to use Mars' atmosphere to slow down, or Venus, or anywhere else. That's what you do. Right. So it does a second aero brake maneuver on March 30th, 1991, 120 kilometers over Africa, which lowers okay. the velocity by 2.8 meters per second and drops the apogee by 14,000 kilometers, or 8,700 miles. Wow. And this concludes the primary mission of Hyten. Yeah, mission accomplished. It, it did its, did its yep. stuff. George Bush, mission accomplished. Right, there we go. <laughs> and so, Ladies and gentlemen, we got it. Exactly. Oh, God, draw the sun. So these are all the orbits that the uh, that Hyten did. i got to draw the sun. I'm sorry. i got to draw the sun on all of these. It's the crazy spaghetti of orbital mechanics. reference frames. Yep. So you can see all the different maneuvers, and you can see the geotail orbit there, because that's kind of what geotail mm -hmm. is going to do, right? Because the sun's over here. Geotail is going to orbit like this. I actually found diagrams of the orbits for Geotail, doing some quick research on that. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it was really interesting. Also, Geotail oh. ended its mission back in November. Oh, so we can do, we can make a video about that. Eventually. It's not very, okay. it's a 30 year mission. Yeah. And pretty much all okay. they're looking at is Earth's magnetic field. Oh, so, it's, so that's yeah. really interesting. Look, here's Earth's magnetic field on your birthday. Look, here's Earth's magnetic field a day later. Look, here's Earth's magnetic field. It's not that interesting. So it's like watching the weather, where it's yeah. like only weird people are interested in it. Yeah, space nerds. Ew. Yeah. So this is what all the mission looks like. You got the arrow breaking in there. You got lunar flybys. You got, you can see the lunar flybys and kind of how they, the apogees change. Yeah, you can kind of see the initial, that first orbit right, yep. there, right in there. You can see how it processes. So now, what do you do next? You got a spacecraft, you got some propellant left over, and it's still working, right? Unlike yeah. uh, Clementine, uh, the first mission to the moon for NASA since the 70s, which had a problem. We'll talk about that when we talk about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll talk about that when we talk about it. Yeah, we'll get there. All right, Dad. <laughs> yeah. So now, Hyten's currently in an orbit of 759,000 kilometers by 29,000 kilometers, which Jeez. is a lot. It's a big orbit. It's 28.6 yeah. days long. So that's right. It's a lunar month. The spacecraft. Right. Now, this is uh, right after the arrow breaking. Okay. Uh, has about 130 meters a second or about 12 kilograms of propellant left over. So now you got okay. two plans of what you want to do left with a spacecraft. Mm -hmm. One, fly through L4 and L5, Earth, Moon, to look for Kordaluski clouds. And okay. enter lunar orbit with Hyten, right? The Japanese are feeling pretty sore over the loss of Hagoromo. They want to confirm their spacecraft enters 
lunar orbit. Right. Be the they, they want to yeet a, a beach ball at the moon and hope it works. Yeah. They want to make sure that this one actually works. Which makes them the third country to actually do that. Okay. Yeah, because it was United States, Soviet Union, and then right. 20 and so years later. Number three. Yeah, Japan. Now, Lagrange points. In Kerbal <laughs> Space Program, you don't have these because Kerbal Space Program does patched conics, one point mass. Okay. So if you enter, like, uh, orbit around Kerbin, right? And you make your apogee that reaches kind of close to the Mun, but doesn't really hit it. Yeah. It just doesn't, nothing happens, right? And you fly close right. to the Mun. Whereas in reality, with n body physics, which is what the universe runs on, it'll, mm-hmm. the Mun will actually t- uh, tug on the spacecraft a little bit. Okay. Oh, so it does have some, like, gravitational yeah. effects. Right. Tides. Right. It, it right. impacts a lot of our spacecraft. It's what moves them. It perturbs them. So with n body physics, there's these things called Lagrange points that are the byproducts of the primary body. So in this case, the sun, which I'll make a smiley face for. <laughs> Thank <laughs> That's you. the sun. And Earth. Because it's not just the sun and the Earth you're taking into account. You're also taking into account the center of mass of the Earth-Sun system, which right. is here right. so if you have a spacecraft up here at l4 you actually balance out the gravitational forces between these three objects oh lagrange points so pretty much everybody has five of them so you have l1 l2 l3 l4 and l5 now l4 and l5 are uh, 120 degrees that looks like 120 degrees to you no, it's six, yeah, it's about 60 forward and 60 back. Yeah, 120 degrees apart. So pretty much there's spots, like L1 and L2, you can actually orbit them. Oh. When we talk about ISEE3, we'll talk about this a bit more. But you can, okay. So there's spots of equilibrium, because you can see in the kind of the topographic map of gravity, there's a bit of a uh-huh. weird spot that you can orbit. Yeah, it's like a little, little ridge. Right? And then L2 also you can orbit around similarly. So like huh. James Webb. That's orbiting L2 right now. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's a weird orbit. They're called like Lissajou orbits, if I pronounce that correctly. They're really weird. Okay. They're also unstable. Uh, L3, oh. yeah, L3, L1, and L2 are actually kind of unstable. So, right, you ever hear about like these ideas about counter Earths on the opposite side of the sun? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they don't yeah, exist. I've heard about it. Because yeah, one, one would have detected it by now because we have spacecraft. And secondly, they would have drifted to L4 or L5. Now and then we've gotten in full view. Yeah, we would have seen them. Would have been you know, make little. I'm making a face at him right now. Now, right, would have made TikToks about. Yeah, would have made. Oh god, they would have blown us up. Rightfully so. (laughs) Now, of these five L points, L4 and L5 are actually stable. Mm -hmm. You can actually fall into them. Now, the famous place for these are the Jupiter Trojan asteroids. So, if you look at the diagram of the asteroid belt, you'll notice where Jupiter is, because at L4 and L5, six degree, degrees ahead and behind it, there's just clusters of asteroids just out there. Oh. Yeah, they're called Trojan asteroids. Earth actually has two of them. We just discovered one recently in L4. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, we found one for uh, Mars as well. It's called Eureka. Ah. They're, they're interesting things. But what would also collect there, theoretically, is dust. In the Earth-Moon okay. system, the Kordeluski clouds. So the idea is, fly the spacecraft through there, you should detect more dust, because there's Kord- okay. Kordeluski clouds. Right. Right. Because there's stuff there. Yeah. So have I explained Lagrange points well to you? I want to make sure before we move on, because we're going to start talking about some other stuff. Yes. You understand L points? They're weird, yep. they're weird spots you can hover around and chill. Cool. They're the vibes, the vibes within end body. So the problem is, entering lunar orbit is a challenge, because with using a classic Hamann transfer, some basic maneuvering, you need 250 meters a second, a delta v. And they only have 130. They don't have enough. Oh. There has to be a better way. <laughs> Try our new product. Exactly. <laughs> now. I'm going to introduce you to a guy named Ed Belbruno. He's a... Ed Belbruno. Yes. Okay. He is a physicist and mathematician and artist. 
uh, who was Ooh. working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. His initial work was on Galileo trajectories. Okay. And then he was part of a, uh, a lunar gas can mission proposal. Because we can't, oh, okay. we can't escape gas cans now. <laughs> yeah, I guess The so. idea was to launch a lunar space probe from the shuttle payload bay and have it go to the moon. Oh, and to, awesome. Yeah, and to do that, you need some interesting uh, trajectories. Uh-huh. And one of the things he came up with is using uh, n-body physics and chaos theory, he came up with something called fuzzy orbits. Fuzzy orbits. Yes. Okay. Also known as weak stability boundary theory, or at least implementing that. Okay. Now, the original... So he's caught... So he... Okay, so I remember telling you the story better the first time we recorded this, but... So he came up with a way of capturing spacecraft into lunar orbit using about 40% less propellant. Ooh, that's some nice savings. For a mission called Lunar Prospector, that was canceled. Oh. He was feeling pretty bad about that. Yeah, I'd imagine. And then one day... Now, this memo here says 1990, so right after the aerobraking maneuvers... His boss comes in to his office at JPL and says, Hey, the Japanese want to put their Muses A spacecraft into lunar orbit, but they don't have enough fuel to do that. We've been trying to think up of some ways to do that. Ed then turned to the ceiling and said, Thank you. <laughs> and he wrote a memo detailing using weak stability boundary theory to send Hyten into lunar orbit. Now, this memo, this very memo, was sent unsolicited to the Japanese. So basically just like, hey, Ayo, hey, I heard you got something going on. I got the solution for you yeah. right here. <laughs> now, this is the lunar gas can. Okay. Yeah, so you see this. Yeah, it's got to, again, there it is, and it's going to take two years to get to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Walking speed there. Oh, yeah. Now, so I want to introduce you to something called weak stability boundary theory and the ballistic capture trajectory. So it's a low energy transfer to the moon. Now, in the classical sense, going from the Earth to the moon, like the Apollo missions, you do an impulsive maneuver, right? It's called a Haman transfer, right? You do a maneuver at your perigee, you kick your apogee up to the moon, and then you fall into the moon, and then you get captured into lunar orbit. It's the low energy system. But the problem is you don't have enough propellant for that. Right. But you don't need to do that. Instead, okay. what you do is what he proposed was launching Hyten on a lunar swing by to carry it up to Earth Sun L1. So that's this up here. And that is a weak stability boundary. So now okay. so take a look closely here at L1 uh-huh. and the shape of kind of the gravity uh, contours. Uh-huh. You can notice it looks kind of like a hill. Yes. Right? So the idea is it's unstable up there. It's a weak stability boundary. It's very easy if you squirt your spacecraft the wrong way, just a little bit, it falls into heliocentric orbit, or it falls back to Earth. Oh, okay. Right? So, like, it, it rolls down to either side of the hill. Right? You can use that to your advantage, so if you get okay. up there to that weak stability boundary, and f- at the right spot, you can score your engines with a little bit of propellant and do massive trajectory changes, oh. as shown here in this diagram. So the idea is, now this, of course, was a year before it actually gets implemented, fly by the moon. So this is, right, so here's the sun. Got to draw the sun. <laughs> Got to draw the sun. Because the sun's really cool in this one. And we're to use it's doing a lot of heavy lifting. Yes, it is. You use the end body physics of Earth, Moon, Sun, and Hyten, go up to the weak stability boundary up here at uh-huh. this maneuver, and then do a 30 meter per second burn, which, as you can okay. see, makes the orbit really big, yeah. bigger than lunar orbit, but yeah. in a way that'll toss it to hit the moon. Oh, now Earth and the moon also have L points, right? It's two body Mm -hmm. physics, and it also has weak stability boundaries. 
Oh, so you you go from one weak stability boundary yeah. into another weak stability boundary? Right. You aim it perfectly. So there's actually so there's a trajectory correct. So there's maneuver one. And there's another one like about here, and okay. it tosses will toss Hyten into Earth Moon L two, at the right spot, where Hyten would be ballistically captured into lunar orbit. Oh dang! Then it's falling through that hill. Right. And enters lunar orbit. Wow. And so the available delta V at the time, a year before, was 250 meters a second. The mission uh-huh. delta V, depending on which one they went with, 30 to 160 meters per second. Ooh. There's two proposed. Again, I've linked the, the paper. Uh, this is one of this is the first one with the 30 meter per second uh, trajectory. Okay. But 30 meters per second versus 300. It's a tenth. Yeah, that is a significant difference. That's that's quite a savings, a good deal. I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> and more references to things that I hope some people yeah. have seen RoboCop. If you haven't, go watch RoboCop. It's a very good movie. Stop watching this, go watch RoboCop. Yeah. Actually, stay here for now and then watch RoboCop. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, obviously. you know. Yeah. And share it with Be your sure friends. To support us on Patreon. That doesn't exist. We don't need one of those. Now, the one thing about this, if you'll notice, is five-day time ticks. This is a really long trajectory. But, again, that's some savings right there. 30 meters yeah. per second. Yeah. Now, have I explained weak stability boundary to you properly? Yes. Basically, there's gravitational hills that you can roll down to get captured into the moon yeah. with way less fuel. Yeah. Downside, it's take, it's, it takes longer. But it's a, it's a spacecraft. You don't have to worry about it. It's like five months extra mission time for, yeah, for weight there aren't savings. There any people on there. Right? Your weight savings will be phenomenal because you're not going to use as much propellant. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let me just make sure I got everything here. Yeah. Now, Japan accepts the unsolicited proposal. Ooh. And what they do is they put it on a lunar flyby trajectory in April 1991 performing S9, so that's this maneuver here, which will toss mm-hmm. it out to Earth-Sun L1, which, that's in the wrong spot. Is it? When, when is the reference taken, though? That's true. That might be, yeah, that might be the, the reference wrong. Or I might be, I found the wrong diagram. No, it's because <laughs> it gets captured, yeah. yeah. So it puts the apogee up at Earth-Sun L1, so at 1.5 kilom- million kilometers, Right up there, okay. that hill, and it does a maneuver, and then it does a second lunar encounter, I mean, 10th, on October 2nd, 1991, so, you know, about five months later, and it gets mm-hmm. ballistically captured. Now, the one downside to ballistic capture is it's an unstable orbit because you're to end up flying into L2 again. <laughs> and, right, yeah, Earth, right. Sun, Moon perturbations will pull it back out. Ah, Which, yeah. But the way they designed the trajectory is that it would actually then go back out and then fly through L4 and L5. Oh, so it would just, like, kick it back into the other parts of the mission that it's trying to go on. Oh, and this is, so this, uh, oh, gosh, another vacation photo. <laughs> so this is Shergao. <laughs> this is the island I went on vacation to. This is the part I didn't go to. Uh, I'm flying away from it on a de Havilland uh, Dash 8. That's a propeller plane. Cool. Uh, why are you showing this? Because I thought it'd be funny to include vacation photos. <laughs> Just randomly sprinkle them in? Yes. <laughs> okay. So you can see here, in this diagram over... So this diagram, which is a bit harder to read, you can see the swing bys. Right? Comes in. Loop, again, it's a different uh, reference frame. Uh, right. Because loop-de-loops through L4. Comes around. Mm-hmm. Again, this is it's the reference frame. It's not actually doing loop-de-loops. It's in a normal circular-ish orbit. An elliptical orbit, yeah. right? And this is, of course, the one we use up front because it's a lot cleaner. So it goes through L4, it goes through L5, and it gets captured around the moon again. After watching some Turner Classic movies. Yep, more Turner Classic movies. So then Hyten returns to the moon on February 15th, 1992, using 81.53 meters a second, a delta V. Okay. And the orbit, which I didn't fix this. I forgot. To, I, I added those pictures to the slides, but I didn't fix the one mistake. The orbit is 49,000.4 uh, 
kilometers by 422 kilometers, which is like 30 and a half thousand by 262 miles. Okay. It's really, really long orbit. You can, yeah, you can see it here. Because again, it gets captured through L2. Right. So it's, right. it's going to go through that. Now, Haiti remains in lunar orbit until running low on propellants in early 1993, which is due to perturbation from the Earth and the Sun. Got it. Right, because it's, again, end body physics. The Sun's tugging on it. Just a little bit. Right. Just enough. So two t- Turner Classic movies are done on February 3rd and March 30th. A lot of early in the year maneuvering going on here. Yeah. Nothing happens after April. I guess not. Uh, so allows it to hit the moon on... The near side, so the Earth-facing side. It was originally going to hit the, the far side, but the Japanese wanted to take pictures of the impact, uh, okay. which I couldn't find any. I'm sorry. So it hits the moon Dang. on April 11th, 1993, at 3.03 in the morning, Japan Standard Time. Nice. And it hits on the southern hemisphere. Cool. So let's look at some results. This yes. right here shows you a sample Munich dust counter impact. So you got like, okay. signals, and then you can see the impact. And this one right. was done on February 18th, 1990, at 541 in the afternoon. Okay. Oh, and it tells you the voltages. I'm assuming you can use the voltages to calculate the trajectory based off that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So it's a, I guess, Germans made this. Yeah, there's charts on the next page that I'll... Okay. That'll show kind of the impacts. Now, as for the Kordeluski clouds, the results were inconclusive because the spacecraft only threw, flew through L4 and L5 once. Oh. So it could have missed them. Oh. Since then, they actually have been proven to exist. Oh, so there are Kordeluski clouds. Yeah. There's the clouds of, of interplanetary dust just chilling at L4 and L5. Huh. Yeah. Neat. So this is the data from the Munich dust counter. It's not very clear. So this one here shows you the time between impacts, one over that. So, so what does that mean? I don't know. I see three distinct spikes. Yeah, and these are days but... from launch. So I'm going to guess that these are when it hits. I think these are apogees maybe or perigees. Okay. Someone in the comments will get mad at us for saying these. So this also, so these are particle flux. So this is the amount of particles hitting it at the distance from Earth. So you see it's kind of consistent on the yeah. different years. No. Not really changing all that much. Yep. So then this shows the heliocentric particle velocity in kilometers per second and the particle masses. This is a logarithmic scale, so you can kind of see the distribution there. Kind of linear-ish. It also looks like it's yeah. going to hug you. It's like, oh, hey, hug. Right? Yeah, kind of a weird shape. Okay, wait, where's the sun? <laughs> ah, hey. <laughs> I gotta draw the sun, okay? Beautiful, beautiful artistry. This is, I'm an amazing artist. So this it's magnificent. So what these are showing is the locations and the directions of the dust impacts on the spacecraft. So it's, it's kind of all over the place. Well, it's in the orbit around the... It's the orbit of the Earth, right? Because that's the right. sun. So... Yep. Kind of consistent. I wonder if they were looking to see if they like, because like meteor showers are us passing through like comet debris tails, right? Right. So it could be that. Maybe they're looking for something like that. Okay. I'm not a scientist. I'm an engineer. <laughs> so this is the largest coconut, one of the largest coconut farms in the world. <laughs> oh my God. In Shergao. <laughs> the island I went to. <laughs> also, on my Discord, which you, you should join, I put the link in the description. I will post a picture of me looking like a generic American tourist. Because there's one. Because you haven't already? I haven't. No, I'm saving it for Monday when I post this. Okay. So these are all coconut trees. You wow. Get coconuts, that's a lot man. of coconut trees. Yeah. I got to drink coconut water. Delicious. Which is good. Yeah. It's like Gilligan's that's Island, good. like I told you before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful island, by the way. You should all go to Chagall. It's great. Yeah. All I can see is Francis Ford Coppola just blowing up those trees oh. with you know, lots yeah. of explosives. But I did, I did go down that river, and all I could think <laughs> on the boat was, okay, VC's going to pop out somewhere. <laughs> is that bad of me? Am I a bad person for thinking this? You are a conventional American That's true. for thinking that. So here's another result. So let's take a look at this trajectory here. 
this look kind of familiar to you? Yeah, it looks, it looks rather familiar. Yeah. yeah. So this is Capstone. This is the 12 kilogram satellite that's orbiting the moon right now. Wait, it's the oh. same weight as uh, Hagoromo. Oh. Yeah. So what do you see? It looks like uh, that ballistic trajectory. Yeah. That our guy from a uh, from JPL was talking about with the whole fuzzy orbit up to L1 and then going into the moon. Yeah. Because guess what? It works. <laughs> so, hey, take a look at this. So this... Yeah, that's that same trajectory. Yeah, so this is GRAIL. This is a mission that measured the moon's uh, gravity. It's a really interesting uh, mission. We're not going to talk about it anytime soon because... It's just not that it. We have a schedule. To we have keep a schedule, up. but yeah. So we launched these two spacecraft on a ballistic capture trajectory to the moon. So we launched the Holy Grail to the moon using this uh, trajectory. Yeah. Wow. Using weak stability boundaries. Huh. And then here is the South Korean mission. Which guess what? Wow! Look at it that. Is, looks very similar. It works. <laughs> It works. It's science. You save up to 40% of your propellant. Why wouldn't you use that discount? Yeah. Because it takes five months to get to the moon instead of three days. Eh. eh patience, details, who cares? It's worth it. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I think the, actually, the Japanese lunar lander that failed, I think they also did the ballistic capture. So they didn't, so they just used it again. They keep using this. Because it works. Yeah. That's the beauty yeah. of this. It's it did a technology demonstration beyond the scope of what they originally planned, <laughs> which I think is yeah. very cool. Oh yeah. Also, here's a Spanish cannon. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, f at Fort Santiago in the Intramuros era and area in Manila. So that's I think City Hall for Manila. So just shoot it at, Mil so if, at City Hall. So if you want to do a recall of the mayor, I just you know, just saying. I have an idea. So these are... I, I've come to dispute the election results. Yeah. <laughs> so this... Yeah, I don't think this is an original canon from the, like, 1570s when the Philippines was colonized by Spain. I think this came later. I think it's more of a 1700s design. Okay. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So what did we learn today? <laughs> I learned that you can uh, really mess with end body physics to do some wacky orbits. Yeah. I learned that uh, th the band almost got back together. Yep. Um, Actually, the Italians were going to build their own launch vehicle. This would be a scout derived one. I, I assume they changed the fuel to pasta. Presumably. Yeah. Or wine. It would be a hybrid using um, olive oil and, uh, <laughs> and pasta. <laughs> Ah, that's yeah. yeah, of, that's, course. of course. Actually, it's, it's funny because my, my professor for aerospace propulsion, he's an Italian guy. So we started uh, to talk about specific impulse of propellants. He did include olive oil <laughs> as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so we learned about the first Japanese mission to the moon. And we learned about yeah. the biggest achievement of it, which was not part of the plan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's just, that's the thing I really like about this mission. It's just, it's this weird concept unsolicited advice here's how you go to the moon and they did it yeah and it worked yeah and then everyone just copied yeah. it yeah it's like yeah here's the homework just change it up a bit yeah actually what's funny is that because i'm thinking about there's another mission the first commercial spacecraft to go to the moon went there by accident uh oh. we're actually gonna talk about it uh, it's in my list of second recommend second list of recommendations that you have to okay. fill out uh they actually right. patented the trajectory to to fix the to save the spacecraft, and I found it. <laughs> Wait, there's a patent yeah. for an orbit specific sa way of saving the spacecraft. Yeah, when we talk about it. It'll oh, be interesting. Because wow. I was reading because okay. I was reading about Hyten, and that's how I found out about uh, it was HGS three. I think it is is the spacecraft, and I found okay. I, just, I was in my research. That's how I found. So what else do we learn today? Um, I learned that the Philippines is a beautiful country. It's also very hot. Oh, that was my phone. Sorry about that. You gonna answer it? No, no, it was a little 
we'll think it probably got like an email or something it doesn't it's matter. an email telling you to pick up the phone <laughs> yeah <laughs> fix your audio <laughs> that's what the email is <laughs> my audio is fine it's your audio that needs fixing i'm gonna cry myself to sleep tonight because of that i hope you do yeah Maybe then you can dream about going on a, pl- a ballistic trajectory to the moon. That'd actually be kind of fun. It'd take five months. Yeah. I don't think I'd be willing That's to true. sit in that chair for five months. I mean, the, the flight to the Philippines was 15 hours, and I got I threw up twice. So <laughs> yeah. I don't think sitting five months on my trip would be that fun. I'd have throw up a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's see. In twice in 15 hours, that means you have a seven and a half hour average. So like, over the course of five months, how many times? Oh, God, we get a calculator. <laughs> so five months is what? It's five times 30. So that's 150 days. Well, no, it's 30 and a half, right? Because oh. it's 31, 30, 31, 30. Right. So, right. It's, so it's, it's five times 30.5 times 24. Okay. And it's what? Every seven and a half hours? Yep. I'm going to throw up 488 times. <laughs> There's not going to be anything in your stomach left. But if I save up enough, right, and I puke at the right spot, I'll get myself on the ballistic trajectory. <laughs> you use it as propulsion. That's my propulsion system. That's Just quickly open up the window, dump your guts, and then close it back up again. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> We're adults. <laughs> And this has been end of mission. No, we're not done yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> we also learned about Kordaluski clouds. Yes. Yeah. That we did. A lot of fuzzy stuff. A lot of fuzzy things, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it also reminds me, in the Philippines, there's a lot of stray cats. Oh, really? Yeah. A stray cat visited me in my hotel. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, oh, it was a hostel, technically, but I got a private room at the hostel in Shergao. We, okay. we let it in and pet it for a bit. <laughs> And we let it go. <laughs> yeah. I got a picture of that. I'm not going to post that picture, but... <laughs> oh. Yeah. That was fun. I want to see the cute kitty. Yeah. There's just stray cats everywhere. Also, we we bribed one or two by uh, feeding them. Oh. They're just everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So, if you want to make friends with cats, go to Shergao. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great place. Also, if you're an American, you'll be probably the only, one of the only Americans there. If you like Australians, they'll be there. Being all Australian y. Their funny accent. Doing Australian things. Yeah. Trying to fist fight the kangaroos that are definitely on the Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so. This is a very short episode. Yeah. But, I mean, it's a short mission, it's a short spacecraft. Yeah. So, as you can see here, we've got the next mission we're going to talk about. What do you think it's going to be? Yeah. Looks like um, something to do with uh, uh, launching bald eagles into space and then racing them against small uh, shuttles and gas cans, presumably. Actually, no, those are uh, these. That's this. Oh, cool. That's an HG. That, yeah, so that's the Hughes satellite bus that we talked about with STS-7. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So the next mission we're going to talk about is STS-51A. Because the one after that's 51F. That numbering ah. scheme is awful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who came up with it? It was a NASA engineer who was afraid of the number 13. Uh-huh. I'm dead serious. <laughs> Some emphasis on the dead part. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So in the next episode, we're going to talk about STS-51A. And we're going to talk about this awesome image. Isn't this cool? That is an incredible image. I, I like that he, uh, that the astronaut has a, a steering wheel and is, like, pretending to drive it through space. Yeah. Actually, I have, I actually have the, the technical diagrams for that. Oh, sweet. Yeah. I'm excited. It's going to be a really fun episode. All right. Um, oh, just one thing. Special thanks to Rizzy for keeping me alive in the Philippines. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rizzy. Yeah. All right, then. I think this has been end of mission.